Welcome everyone. My name is Bill Sellers. I'm the president of National History Academy and this is part of a series visiting defining historic places in the United States and today we're very privileged to be at the Fox, Foxfire Museum and Heritage Center in Georgia to uh, talk about and learn about uh, the Cherokee Indian removal as well as a little bit about the Foxfire Museum. Um, a little bit about National History Academy. We've been operating since 2018. We've had residential programs in 2018 and 2019. Uh, moved to online after the pandemic hit in 2020 and we'll be online again this summer and look forward to serving high school students around the country and around the world uh, again this summer. Uh, last year we had 665 students from all 50 states and 20 countries learning about the foundations of democracy and uh, the you know, what it means to be an American by visiting, defining historic sites, by studying uh, cases developed by the Case Method Institute um, at, at Harvard, uh, listening to uh, uh, national leaders as part of our speaker series. But, but we really are built around visiting these defining historic places. You, you learn and absorb history in a different way while, while being at, um, at places like Foxfire. And uh, we're privileged today to have Dr. Brent Glass, who's worked with National History Academy from the beginning and is you know, perhaps the nation's foremost expert on learning at historic places. Uh, I know that Brent doesn't like uh, hyperbole, but, <laughs> but he really is. He was uh, director of the uh, Smithsonian National Museum of American History um, for uh, a number of years, what, 2005 to 2012, 2004 to 2012, Brent? Around there, yes. But um, Brent, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Bill. You were close on the dates. That was, that's all right. Um, when the, there's no test here. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm really delighted to uh, welcome everyone and especially to connect the National History Academy with Foxfire Museum and Heritage Center. I uh, have been familiar with, the, with Foxfire for many decades and I consider Foxfire to be one of the preeminent history education uh, programs in America, in America uh, and in American history. And I hope that you'll learn a little bit uh, more about what the Foxfire has accomplished over many decades uh, in this visit today. Um, I, am, uh, I had an opportunity to visit Foxfire several years ago and made the acquaintance of Barry Stiles, who's the museum director there, but Barry, had, and he, you will hear from him in a moment, Barry has worn many hats at, uh, at Foxfire, and um, he is now the museum director, but he's an expert on um, just about everything at the site, uh, the museum, the archives. He's been involved in the relocation of a, of a barn. He uh, has been involved in the, the digi digitization project there of all their audio uh, recordings, uh, a very rich library of audio recordings that are now being uh, digitized and um, also in charge of the public history and education program. Uh, so you're going to learn a lot from Barry and he is ably assisted by Cami Ahrens, who is the curator uh, at uh, Foxfire. They've got a, a small but very, very effective team there and I'm delighted uh, now to introduce you to the museum director, uh, Barry Stiles. Welcome everyone and I want to Thank you for allowing us to be involved with the Natural History Academy. It's a privilege for us, and we're glad that you could join us here at our museum. Our museum is a little different than most. It was begun by a bunch of high school students who came up with the idea of writing a magazine back in 1966. The magazine was a huge success. So most people know Foxfire from the Foxfire book series, and the first Foxfire book came out in 1972, and after it came out, students decided to take royalty money from the book sales and to purchase a property that the museum is now on and they also relocated close to 30 buildings up here by going out in the community and, and taking them apart and bringing them up here and putting them back together this our museum is it's built by high school students and it also is a village that we interpret and cami maybe could pan around and you can see some of the buildings it's a beautiful spring day here thing is greened up you know, our focus is on the Southern Appalachian culture, and that's what we interpret and it's what we preserve also. Cammie herself is working on a book now on Appalachian women, which is going to be coming out in a year. So it's, it's pretty neat. Now we're situated 
in extreme northeast Georgia. And all of this land prior to 1819 belonged to the Cherokee. And there was a land session and a treaty of 1819 that opened this up for settlement. And that's when the white settlers began to come in here and settle. And most of the people that came into this area of Georgia came from North Carolina and were predominantly a Scots-Irish culture. And so they brought that with them. And even when students were interviewing people in the 1960s, there were still remnants of this Scots-Irish culture that go back into the 1700s that people were discussing. And I don't think they really realized that it was that old, but even Aunt Ari herself, who's interviewed many times, knew songs that go back into the 1700s from Scotland. So it was pretty amazing that the isolation here in the mountains led to such a preservation of that culture. That's something really distinct for us. And that's part of what our audio collection represents too in our archive. But the most important artifact we have is down below in the wagon shed. And we've been working really closely with our friend at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian to interpret the Cherokee removal. And in that wagon shed, we have the only known wagon that has survived from the Cherokee removal period. And we're gonna be talking about that in a couple of minutes. But first I'd like uh, Dakota to be played so that you can hear the Cherokee perspective more about um, the Cherokee removal. Hi, my name is Dakota Brown. Um, in Cherokee, you say Dakota Wodegai. Um, I am the education director at the Museum of the Cherokee. Um, and I am happy to speak with you guys today on the removal period. The connection to land that Cherokees have is very different from most American people. Most all Americans don't have the kind of connection that Cherokees have to the land. We have been in the same place for thousands of years. Most people can kind of trace their heritage back maybe a couple hundred years or 300 years here in the United States. But for indigenous people, it's very different. Um, and when you spend uh, 15 to 50,000 years, and that's kind of the, the estimates that we get from archeology span is that we've been in our homelands for about 15,000 to 50,000 years. Um, so that's an incredibly long time to spend in an area and spend um, on a piece of land. All of our stories that we have, all of the things that we do, our foods that we eat, the medicines that we have, it comes from the land that we had been on forever. Um, and from a Cherokee perspective, that's the way that we believe. We don't believe um, that we came from anywhere else. We believe that as a people, we began in our homeland. Um, and that's what our stories say, and that's how we believe. Um, so our story um, of how we began as a people is attached to a piece of land that is right near our community, our current community um, in North Carolina. Um, it is just a few miles from the Kuala boundary, uh, which is the boundary of the Eastern Band. The story behind that is that seven medicine men went on top of uh, Kauai, which is um, Klingman's Dome. It's known now as Klingman's Dome. There is where they got all of our medicine, our language, our laws, um, our system of government the way that we would function as a people was figured out uh, on that mountaintop and brought down to a place that we call Kadua. And Kadua is um, luckily owned by the Eastern Band now. We were able to buy it back. Kadua is considered our mother town and that's the place that we believe that we began as a people thousands and thousands of years ago. So we have a different connection to land um, than most anybody else. The only other people that can say that they have that connection is other indigenous folks that haven't been removed from their land and haven't been displaced. But a lot of indigenous people in this country have been displaced from their land. So we're very lucky, the Eastern Band is very lucky to be able to still say that we live in the place that we have for thousands of years. The UKB or the United Kadua Band and the Cherokee Nation, um, they don't have that. Um, and they still refer to 
where we live in Cherokee as home. Um, and so I think that that's important to note that even after all this time since the removal has passed, that um, the people in Oklahoma that were removed still view this place as their home. Um, another thing that I think is important to note about the Cherokee perspective of this is um, the various tactics that were used during the removal period. So um, Cherokees were definitely fighting this um, removal in so many different ways. So Andrew Jackson, although Andrew Jackson did, um, you know, put forth the Indian Removal Act, he wasn't the first one to come up with this idea. This is something that the United States, since the beginning of the United States, had been discussing and talking about, is removing Native people off of land that they wanted. And definitely in the early 1800s, this started gaining popularity um, among political leaders and um, among United States citizens and uh, various state citizens that dealt with Native people. Um, and so I do think it's an important to note that this is, that was a conversation that had been going on for a very long time. And Cherokee people, not just Cherokee people, but other nations that were going, uh, that were facing potential removal, um, had been hearing this for a very long time and knew that this was a possibility. Um, so Cherokees responded to this in a lot of different ways, and there was a lot of tactics that Cherokees used to try to combat this and try to stop this from happening or prevent it in some way. One of the arguments that American political leaders and American citizens at the time were arguing is that Native people were not civilized enough to improve upon their land. So because they weren't using American farming techniques and um, building American style homes, it was considered um, that we were not improving upon the land. And so Native people started to try to appear civilized in the sense that um, they tried to appear more American and do things that um, kind of matched what other Americans were doing um, at the time. So out of this comes the syllabary, um, which is our uh, Cherokee's written language. Other folks began to convert to Christianity um, and they stopped practicing, um, at least in public view, um, traditional forms of beliefs and practices. Um, and so these were all tactics that Cherokees used, and there were many, many, many more that Cherokees used to try to fight removal. Another tactic is that Cherokee governments and officials decided to um, use the United States courts to fight this. And so they took this all the way to the Supreme Court, won, um, and of course, Andrew Jackson basically said, you know, you can pass this, but you can't enforce it. From the highest government that we had, um, and for each citizen, they were doing everything that they could to combat this in various different ways and trying to fight against um, being removed from our homelands. Also prior to this, another important thing to note, prior to the removal, there were several land treaties that were signed. Um, and from a United States perspective, it was Cherokees signing over portions of land. However, from a Cherokee perspective, it was very different. Um, most of the lands that Cherokee people had signed over in these treaties were already um, being encroached upon by um, white settlers. Pretty much all of the treaties, you can, you can look at it from a Cherokee perspective in that way, is that we were trying to stop further encroachment on our lands. We were saying like, okay, we'll go ahead and give up this land that had already been encroached upon, um, but it stops here. Um, and unfortunately, that's not what happened. Um, pretty much every one of those treaties, the, the kind of landlines that were established in those treaties were broken time after time, which is why there's multiple treaties. At the Treaty of New Echota, there was none of those leaders present. So the Treaty of New Echota, from a Cherokee perspective, was not a legal document because 
um, it was signed by, yes, Cherokee citizens, but they weren't represent, uh, representatives of the nation. So I think that that is one of the most important things to note about the Treaty of Mila Chota from a Cherokee perspective. Um, immediately, Chief um, John Ross fought against the Treaty of Mila Chota and um, basically said that this did not represent um, what the Cherokee people wanted and it did not. Uh, most Cherokees, majority of Cherokees, did not support removal. The political leaders and government at the time, the Cherokee political leaders and government at the time, did not support removal um, because it wasn't what the people wanted. There's multiple trails that were taken or multiple routes that were taken. Um, what Cherokee leadership at the time did not know is that the year that removal was happening, um, it was going to be the hottest summer um, on record and the coldest and the harshest winter. Um, and so Cherokees um, at the time, prior to removal, prior to removal, they were held in basically internment camps or stockades, um, if you will. Um, there was most Cherokees did not have time to prepare for this and were taken directly from their homes. Um, so they had sometimes inadequate clothing, um, food was scarce. Um, also the conditions, because there was a lot of people held in a very small area, the conditions were not great and there was a lot of illness and sickness that occurred and disease. Um, so there was a lot of death prior to the removal. The, climate that was going on at the time, the, the weather that was happening at the time, would have made this um, very, very harsh either way. So either they're going in extreme heat or extreme cold, and that was, that was um, what happened. So um, the weather was so harsh, many Cherokees, you know, um, did not make the, the trip. Um, and so there was a lot of, uh, a lot of deaths that occurred um, on the the actual walk to Oklahoma. Another thing impor that's important to mention is not all Cherokees were removed. Um, there was uh, Cherokees that remained here. Um, through various tactics, there was some loopholes in the Indian Removal Act. You see some Cherokees staying to kind of hopefully preserve some land here um, in, in North Carolina and, and in our original homeland. And then the other thing that happened afterwards is a lot of people that went on the removal um, just walked back. There's a, a good many people that um, went on removal and came back. So because of that, we actually have um, a group here, and that's what I'm a part of is the Eastern Band of Cherokees. That's kind of how we're made up is um, the ones that were able to get North Carolina citizenship or the ones that came back um, after removal had happened, the ones that hid out um, in the mountains. Um, that's why the Eastern Band exists um, here in North Carolina. Hello everyone, my name is Tyra Maney and I'm the Cultural Specialist Coordinator at the Museum of the Cherokee. I feel like each family like to some degree has like impacts that still affect them from the Trail of Tears and like the removal era and even after the removal era not long after that um, the government implemented the boarding schools and a lot of indigenous people um, that affected them in a negative way because we weren't allowed to like celebrate or practice like our culture and just within that time period there was a big generational loss as far as like our language and a lot of our beliefs and our culture and it wasn't until 1979 that um, the Indian Religious Freedom Act was passed and up until that point um, a lot of like sacred ceremonies that we did a lot of our songs and dances and our language was considered illegal like from the government's perspective and even um, from my experience, like my grandparents went to boarding schools and my grandmother, she was a fluent speaker, but because of the like traumatic events that happened at the boarding schools, 
she never taught my mom and so then my mom never taught me and so like within one generation in my family like we already lost the language and I know like as a community like we still feel those effects um I think especially now like the younger generations that are coming up um we're starting to see that it's almost like a scare um that our language is dying out and so a lot of us are trying to do what we can to preserve it whether it be um learning like a traditional craft or trying to like learn the language as much as we can or sitting with like our elders or different people in the community who still know these things and trying to learn what we can to preserve it for future generations Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to thank Tyra and Dakota for their input on this. It's been great having them help with us exhibit here in our museum. Most people don't realize the extent of Cherokee land. They occupied 40,000 square miles in the southeast, basically all of Kentucky, most of what is now Tennessee, all of northern Georgia, and parts of western North Carolina, and the upstate of South Carolina. So prior to the Revolutionary War, they occupied a huge amount of territory. After the Revolutionary War, they lost about half of it, I would say. And then through some land sessions and treaties, by 1835, the only thing that was left was that green section there. But Georgia wanted all of it. They wanted control out of all the land in the boundaries of Georgia, although those lands were legally owned by the Cherokee people rightfully so. And just for perspective, we're about right here for the Fox Square Museum in this little corner of Northeast Georgia. So this section here was part of the 1819 land session. And settlers came in. And at one point, this was really the western part of basically the United States. Um, Cherokee owned part of the West in here, and the other parts were territories at that time. Georgia really uh, wanted all Cherokee removed, and they entered into a pact with the federal government, and they ceded land that was to become Alabama, had been part of Georgia, which is kind of odd. And in exchange for that, for Alabama, they wanted removal of all Native peoples from the state of Georgia. And that was going back into 1803. So it really pre-exists, you know, 1838 by, by a long shot. And of course, the Cherokee connection to the land was very important. Their identity, you know, their laws, their medicine, everything comes from the land. So removing the Cherokee from the land is, is removing them from not only their home, but from their cultural identity and just, just a part of their culture. So it's really tragic on so many levels. Cherokee fought against Georgia legally. Georgia extended its laws, Georgia laws, over Cherokee land. And they annulled all of Cherokee's laws within the Cherokee nation, which is just hard to imagine. And that's one of the court cases that, that came up. That's the Worcester and Georgia case. And that's a case that was found in favor of the Cherokee, that Georgia really didn't have the right to affirm its laws over a sovereign nation of Cherokee. And that's the one that was ignored. So really, Georgia had absolutely no right to exert its laws over Cherokee Nation. But they were intent on, on taking the land. They also knew at this point, Andrew Jackson had become president and was in favor of the Cherokee removal and the Indian removal specifically. So all of these factors were, were leading into something terrible for the Cherokee people. And on top of that, if it wasn't enough, gold was discovered. And it was discovered in Cherokee territory. In 1828 and 1829, there's all kinds of gold discoveries going on. And particularly around Dahlonega, Georgia, which is a little bit west of here. And a, a US mint was actually, actually established in Dahlonega. There was so much gold there. And a huge removal fort was built there also. So all these factors just were leading to the Cherokee being forced from their land. The government kind of manipulated things and they found a group of people that were willing to sign a treaty 
And in 1835, the Nuichota Treaty was signed by people like Dakota had mentioned that did not have the authority of the Cherokee people. And so most felt that the treaty was illegal, but nevertheless, it was enforced. And there were specific terms in the treaty that were enforced. And Cherokee people had to leave by May of 1838. That was that was the deadline that was given in that treaty. So it was really a, a harsh thing. And, and the Cherokee fought with petitions and other, other means and just everything they they did and tried was just futile. There's just nothing that worked in their favor. It was a very, very tragic part of our history. Now, the way the, the removal worked in 1838, you know, after the treaty was signed, the deadline was May of 1838. Well, in Georgia, 13 forts were built in the Cherokee Nation, apparently, and armies were stationed there. It was a military action. And Georgia is mostly Georgia militia that were in charge of the removal. And they were stationed at each fort and they were given orders basically to go out, gather up as many Indians as you can, bring them into the forts. And at that point, take your prisoners to the nearest location and do this as fast as you can and as many times as you can until everyone is removed. And they went very fast. Although Cherokees were supposed to be given time to gather up their belongings, they rarely were given time. They were just removed from their house, thrown in wagons and hauled off to the fort which was a prison basically. And they stayed in the prison for several weeks and then were taken out to internment camps. And there's around 11 internment camps where they stayed for months. And the conditions were poor in the forts and in the internment camps and hundreds of Cherokee people died in just a few forts a month. And our wagon here, I mentioned earlier, this is the only known wagon from the Cherokee And this wagon was used in the state of Georgia by the military. It was used by a name, man named Green Daves. He was a private in the Georgia militia. And he was stationed at the fort that it was in Dahlonega called Fort Floyd. And that's where they operated out of. So this was used in gathering up Cherokee for the initial roundup and bringing it into the stockades. And then he was discharged by July of 1838. His work was done. He served about four months. So it was really rapid, really, really rapid. Some Cherokees were able to hide out in the mountains and were never captured, but most unfortunately were captured and brought in. And within the wagon here, we have the names of 500 people that are known to have perished during the Cherokee removal. And we have their ages and their family relationships on that list right there. And you may be able to tell that it's mostly really old people and very, very young people that suffered the most. So if we can, I'd like to, for you to bring up one of the documents, maybe the medical report, if you could. I've got a copy of it here for myself. This is a monthly medical report. This was each camp, and these camps are really the internment camps. They had um, physicians there that were trying to take care of the people. Let me see. Mm -hmm. So on the top row, you can see the camp, the position, the time period, you have recovered, convalescent, sick, and then deaths. And if you just go down to the bottom of the death roll, you can see that the death row, there's 353 died in the internment camps. And this is just through August. So most of the, the detachments that left didn't leave until September, the middle of September. So this number is certainly low, it could even be double. And this number also does not take into account any deaths that happened in the stockade forts. So once the people were in the internment camps, there were three military-led detachments that left uh, to go to what is now Oklahoma. And after the second one left, there were so many deaths that Chief Ross petitioned 
Now the Cherokee people lead the rest of the detachments to go out west. The third detachment, the people heard of this and they wanted to return back to Tennessee, but were refused and had to go out. And that's the Captain Drain detachment. And if you want to pull that up next, the Captain Drain. The Captain Drain was a third detachment that was military led, as I mentioned. And his Cherokee uh, contingency was over a thousand, and they were all from the state of Georgia, the entire contingency. And he had a lot of desertions, which is good. So that a lot of people escaped from his detachment, he had 293 escaped, but he still ended up with 141 deaths. So it was uh, very tragic. And that was the last that was not Cherokee led. So at that, after that point, they stopped all the, the trips because it had become so hot and dry that the rivers were very low and that was causing a lot of trouble getting out there. And they waited until the fall to start the rest of the detachments. And the Cherokee, they led 13 of their own detachments. 13 of them. So if we look at the Captain Drain detachment here, this up, mm -hmm. can't see what's up on the screen. Sorry. So just to, to emphasize what was happening on this detachment, if we go down to the bottom of this list, and this is actually for reimbursements and expenses on the journey out there, and there's a lot of documentation on the Cherokee removal. It's just thousands and thousands of documents that a person can just go through and find all kinds of really mostly terrible things like this one is. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, we can see on July 2nd, 1838, they have one coffin. By July 4th, seven coffins, then another coffin on July 12th, another four coffins, et cetera, et cetera. So these, these coffins are representing deaths that are happening along the, the journey. So it's just, you know, documentation that there was no doubt that these deaths were taking place. And it's just a horrible process that was being undertaken. And even when the Cherokee led their own detachments, they had been in the camps for so long, several months with poor conditions, it's overcrowding rancid water, just disease, that people were, were sick and still dying in the camps, but then they're forced to walk out, you know, basically a thousand miles in really, really harsh conditions. So there still were deaths in the Cherokee-led detachments, just due to the conditions that they had to endure. So it, it, uh, it's a story I, I say many times, is the more you know about it, the worse it is. It's just, it's just an awful, awful story, awful piece of our history. But I'm glad to say, you know, that Cherokee are alive well today and a thriving culture. And, and you know, Dakota and Tyra are just wonderful representatives of the culture. And it's been a pleasure working with them. So I'd like to open it up for questions now. I know there's a lot to cover in this, this topic here. So I'll be happy to discuss it a little bit more. Great, thank you. Um, who originally kept or made the list of people who died? Well, some of it we're not totally sure. We're not totally sure. There's a lot of documentation for each detachment that went out, for instance, the, the leader of the detachment kept a journal. And typically they would be the ones that would document deaths along the trail. And I think within the camps, the internment camps, it would have been camp positions that would have been keeping documents on that. So that's my, just my estimation. And where are the original documents kept today? Well, there should be copies of all of them, of the originals in Washington, D.C., in the National Archives. There are some in the War Department. There are some in the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And then many, many copies of those documents are in the archive of the Museum of the Cherokee Indian. They have thousands of documents, thousands. How many interviews do you have in your collection and what subjects are covered? Well, interviews being people that were interviewed, we have about 2,700 interviews, roughly. Over. Over 2,700 interviews. The topics are everything. Anything you can think about in a person's life is covered from how to make butter to how to heal somebody. Uh, it's just an encyclopedia of knowledge from the mound. So it, it's almost infinite what's covered in it. 
Could you please uh, speak a little bit more about how Foxfire was started, especially the magazine and book series? Sure, sure, I'd like to. Well, we started back in 1966 up at a school called Raven Gap Nakuchi School, which is about two miles from here. And the students in this particular class back in 1966 were not wanting to learn English. And they really decided that before they went to school, but they didn't <laughs> want to learn. And so they were being very, very disruptive in the classroom, throwing things, you know, lighting things on fire in the class, things that you know, would get you expelled today, I'm sure, at least they should. But instead of being expelled, the teacher came in and sat down with the students and they came up with ideas of how to learn things. And they, they decided that they'd write a magazine, although they had no idea what was involved in writing the magazine. And maybe that appealed to them, the unknown. And they, they had to get material from the magazine. And they're encouraged to go out in the local community and start talking to the local people and gather some information. And that's what they did. Although they did have other content for the magazine. They printed the first magazine and it sold out and it had poetry in it, and some art and just various things. And really what the people were wanting to know more about was the local culture. So they started expanding that in, in the next issues of the magazine. And it really wasn't very long until the entire magazine was about preserving the culture of the mountain people. And the more they really pinpointed writing about the local culture, the more popular the magazine became. It's kind of weird. And more people were reading it. And probably within two years, there were people in every one of the 50 states reading the magazine. And that's one of the reasons why the publisher thought it would be a good idea to write the book. The, the magazine was just so popular. And the magazine is still being written today. And Cammy does a lot of work with the magazines. And she facilitates that program for us. Do you want to talk to me about the current program, Cam? Um, sure, yeah. So we still have high school students who um, join us every summer. It's currently a summer leadership program. So we open it to students in the county of Raven. Um, and they come and join us on the property at the museum. They have an office space here and they work for six to eight weeks on um, special projects that are related to uh, Appalachia, but also just to their interests. So we've had students who have conducted podcasts, who've done some documentary work, um, and then they take those experiences, particularly the continuation of the interviews and investigations into their community, um, and they turn those into magazine articles that include photographs and um, excerpts from the interviews that they conduct. And then we publish a magazine twice a year. Um, that really just kind of celebrate student work. It's really important that it's student driven and student choice for what the students do. So that really empowers the students. So a little bit about the books, you know, we talked about you know the first book coming out, but there's there's a whole series of books. There's 12 in our series now, and we have seven or eight companion books. So we have you know over 20 titles in print right now, and we have sold in excess of 